My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, good evening to everyone or good morning wherever you are. Uh, do I need to share my slides or will you guys do that? I'll share my slides. Yes, please, Matt. Yes, please. Okay. That's good. All right. So, um, you know, just a quick little uh, brief on me because probably you don't know me. I'm also kind of a unique person. Um, uh, I went to art school and I studied industrial design. Uh, and uh, from there, I started a company called, well, I started a few companies, but one of them's called Design Turn. And that's a company that uh, really designs and develops products for clients and also manufactures those products for clients uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, another thing that I created was, uh, as Eugene mentioned, the MIT Integrated Design and Management Program. Uh, and that was my first experience creating an entire uh, graduate program for, for school. And that was very exciting. Uh, and from there, uh, I decided to create another school, but this would be for younger students, for people in middle school or in high school, and that's called the New England Innovation Academy. Uh, so I, I do a bunch of things. I'm on the faculty at MIT. I teach in there in the Sloan School uh, of, of, of Management, and I also teach in the Engineering School. Uh, and uh, you'll see why this is important as I show you some slides here. Um, all right, so one thing I want to say is uh, we're living in some pretty exciting times. You know, people like us, uh, we have amazing tools available to us that, you know, younger people uh, take for granted, but for us, it's, it's, it's new. So if you think about when we were growing up, we didn't have Google. And now with Google, uh, you can basically get information whenever you need it. And you can get very deep amounts of, of information. It used to be that we'd have to memorize all this information because if we didn't memorize it, we'd have to go to a library. It wasn't available to us at our fingertips. And what's interesting about this, why am I mentioning this? Because education was designed to solve that problem yeah, where information is yeah. not accessible. And now we still teach the same yeah, way that we ever taught. Yeah. However, the, the landscape has changed when it comes to accessing information. So something, right. very exciting thing. Um, another fabulous thing is what you all know and love is CAD, right? Uh, amazing tools that allow us yeah, to yeah, visualize yeah. product and to model yeah, product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Eugene, uh, you might want to mute your mic. And so, you know, we can imagine things and then we can model them. And with that model, we have the ability of sharing that with people around the globe. And that ability to collaborate across countries, across societies, across cultures, right? Not only does that make technology better or make our design work better, uh, but it also brings us all closer together. And uh, I think that if we're working together in a globally distributed fashion, as we are now, our world is gonna continue to be more united, uh, certainly the people, of the countries, what our, our governments are crazy, right? But the people of this earth generally want to work together, make great stuff together, and love our families and our friends and spend time together enjoying our lives. So I, I love that the way things are going in this digital age that we're in. And then obviously from those CAD models, we can actually make tangible products using 3D printers or laser cutters or CNC's or whatever it is, right? But I can actually, you know, beam a file over to China and a few weeks later, I will get molded parts, you know, in the mail. So that's, that's just an incredibly powerful tool. And from there, we can scale it 
and those same people in China may work with a factory and ramp up production. So now you might have made one or two prototypes, but now you can make thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of product, and it's all done from your home office uh, in Ukraine, or in my case, in Boston, Massachusetts. So we are just in this amazing new age, and it's called the digital age, right? We came out of the industrial age. Education has changed. Education has continues to be taught to the industrial age, right? Meanwhile, we're in the digital age. So everything that I have been focusing my work on is changing education so that it is appropriate and useful and inspiring to people living in the digital age using the tools that we all know and love on this call. Now, one other thing I just wanna say is we have amazing tools. And what's interesting is the industrial age, much of the work we did was trying to figure out how to make stuff. How do we make that stronger and lighter? How do we make that impact resistant or abrasive, you know, uh, resistant to abrasives? Or, you know, how do we make those parts fit together? Or how do we create a complex geometry and make that out of a piece of tool steel so we can mold plastic bars? It's all about how, 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 and a lot of things were done by hand. But we have come so far with our tools. Our tools can really do anything. They can almost do anything we can imagine. And so my, 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 uh, what I'd like to put to everyone here is that our real challenge is where do we go? What do we do with these amazing tools? What is the beauty that we can imagine that our tools can make a reality? And we need to spend more time thinking about beautiful outcomes, right? Beautiful product, beautiful experiences, beautiful societies, and then use our tools to make those a reality. And we tend to focus more on the tools, even to this day, and that's fabulous. But we also need to figure out where we're going and what we're doing with these, with these amazing tools. And some companies do that really well. So here are some examples. I mean, you know them, most of them. You probably know all of these companies, except maybe the chair. The chair is a product by Herman Miller, and that's the Herman Miller Eames Lounge chair. And it's a very expensive chair. Um, why do I show it to you? Because it was invented, it was designed in 19... 50 something and it's still on the market that's a heck of a lifespan for a product and it sells for around six thousand dollars and it has incredible profit margin so why is a product like that so successful and my answer or my theory is that because it has incredible value to us to people to consumers right as long as things have value you're gonna have a successful business and you might have a very long product life. So other companies that are doing that really well, Apple, Apple does that well. Pixar, creating lots of value, right? I mean, Pixar is basically code, right? It's a bunch of code that when you see it on a screen, representing changing the colors of pixels on your screen, that's all it's doing. You got code changing colors of pixels and code causing certain frequencies of sound to come out of the speakers. That's all it's doing. When it's doing, it makes us laugh, it makes us cry, it makes us feel deep emotion, empathy for these just pixels and sound, right? That is an example of how technology should result in profound emotional value. That's what we should be doing. Starbucks knows this, you know, they create an environment that's very rich and, and emotionally satisfying. Tesla does this, you know, they really reimagined the driving experience. Um, and Apple has always made computers as beautiful an experience as they could. Another thing that's interesting about all of these products is they are more expensive than their competition. That's kind of interesting, right? So normally you would say, how can these very successful companies 
cost more to the consumer because we usually think that cost is the driver, right? We think of cost as the thing that drives sales. It's not necessarily cost, and Apple has proven that beautifully. More on this in a moment. So all of these products are really this blend, okay? This is a Venn diagram that I created for MIT, um, and these are actually, we made t-shirts out of these because they were so important. And, you know, the, the idea that when you design a product or create a business, you really need an interdisciplinary approach. You need to see that enterprise or that product development challenge through three very distinct lenses. And one lens is obviously engineering, right? That makes sense because engineering is what's going to make that product feasible. It's going to bring it in at cost. It's going to be reliable. It won't break. It's going to be safe and conform to all regulatory uh, requirements, so on and so forth, right? So that's engineering. Business, business is, you know, very important too because that's who's raising the capital. That's who's dealing with marketing and, de and developing supply chains and developing, you know, your distribution channels uh, and developing, you know, sales and business partnerships and relationships. So without business, you may not have a product that's viable. So business is very important. But the one that's always forgotten is design. And design is are those disciplines that make a product desirable. They make us want to part with our money. And if it's super desirable, we'll part with a lot of money, right? The more desirable it is, the more money we'll pay for it. And a great example of this is like, you know, um, well, there's a bunch of examples, but I'll use a, a Ferrari. A Ferrari, which is $360,000, which is about, performs about the same as a Chevrolet Corvette Z06. Now that Ferrari is probably four or five times more expensive than that Corvette, yet people will buy that Ferrari. Why? Because it's so desirable, right? And so think about design as you go through your lives, as you put together curriculum, as you put together new schools, as you put together new businesses, as you design products to support innovation, think about this Venn diagram that really design and engineering and business are going to all be working together to create something beautiful where they intersect, which is why there's a heart in them. And if you do this well, this is some research that was done by the Design Management Institute, and uh, it basically tracked 12 companies over 10 years that this uh, group, Design Management Institute, felt that were design-centric companies. So in other words, Apple, Coke, Ford, Herman Miller, that's the people who made the chair, IBM, Intuit, so on and so forth, all of those companies have big design teams. They put a big emphasis on design. They're, they said, we're going to make design important in our company. And so they track the performance of those 12 companies over the rest of the S&P 500. Those are S&P 500 companies. And those design-centric companies outperformed the S&P 500 by 211%. And that's not changed to this day. So this is my way of saying, include design in your activities and you will see business success. All right, and this is my little formula. So you take that Venn diagram where you have design, engineering, and business. So you have design making things desirable. You have engineering making things feasible. If you have something that's desirable and feasible, you have something that's viable, okay? so. What does that mean? Well, you know, desire, as I mentioned earlier, desirability is the what kind of value to the customer does your product have? Does it, do, do they look at your product and go, that is amazing, I gotta have it, right? That's what you want. If they don't say that, you got some design work to do. And that comes through emotional value or functional value, okay? Feasibility is about cost, repeatability, you know, uh, how robust it is. And then viability is really about the health of the finances of the company. 
And as I've been mentioning, the opportunity here, so you know, if you want to increase profit, you have two options. One option is to reduce cost. If you can sell a product for $10 and it costs you $5 to make it and you want to increase profit, one thing you can do is you can reduce the cost to $4. Now you're making $6 profit instead of five. Well, another option would be to make it more desirable. And now what you can do is charge $11 for it. And it still costs you $5 to make, but now you're making $6. But guess what? When you add value, it doesn't necessarily, there is, there's more headroom than that. So maybe you can charge set, uh, $12 and make $7 in profit. So desirability is a huge opportunity. It's a lot easier to charge more or to create more value that you can charge your customer for than it is to reduce cost. Reducing cost is usually one or two or 3% reduction per year, whereas creating something more desirable it could be 20% more, 30% more at the point of sale. So think about that phenomena as you do your work. So desirability is key. And I uh, just wanted to beat that point home. And you can have products like that's all these folks did is they just hire designers to help. That's all they did. They don't have to do the design work, but as a manager, you make sure that you create a team that is balanced with engineering, business, and design. And a last couple of things I'm just gonna leave you with are design processes. Uh, one process that I always start with that we teach, I teach everywhere, I mean, this is really a hallmark of what I teach, is this idea of human-centered design, or HCD. And human-centered design, this is the process as I teach it, is where you go out and you explore a problem before you start thinking about solutions. Most inventors, you know, me, myself included earlier in my life, I would say, ooh, you know, there's a problem, I'm gonna make a solution and then I'm gonna try to see if anyone likes a solution. That's not the right way to do it. The best way is to go understand the problem, talk to many people, especially your, your potential customers, find out what they're thinking and feeling. Then synthesize that information into like a PowerPoint presentation okay, that you can share with other people. Then, once you synthesize the problem, you have incredible understanding of what the problem is, great clarity on the problem. Then you'll start creating solutions in the creation phase. And then you show those solutions to your stakeholders in the testing phase. And you'll probably learn that you didn't quite have it right. So you talk to them and you explore the problem a little more. You repeat this outer circle over and over, maybe two or three times, until you're testing very successfully with your concepts and then you implement, okay? And you wanna do this as quickly as possible. So you wanna do that with sketches and cardboard models and things you hand build, really quick stuff. Um, but when you implement, that's when you build a CAD model or two. And that's when you start printing parts. And that's when you start working with vendors, right? And that's when you start maybe creating molds or dyes or other automatic assembly equipment. And that's when you start production. And that's where the time and money is. But if you spend a little time and energy and a little bit of money here, what you end up implementing is far more desirable, okay? So this is one little process, human centered design. Another process is your sort of classical design studio. This is Porsche's designs, one of Porsche's design studios. You know, and here you can see in the background, they've got drawings of cars and sketches and renderings, and then they have details. And then these two cars right here are actually made out of clay. And they're using real wheels, okay? And they're using real headlight assemblies, and they're using real molded plastic parts. But everything else, all the surfacing, the roof line, all that is new. And so they are, oh, excuse me. So they are um, really trying to look at the form of this car, the aesthetics of this car very, very carefully at full scale in the quickest way they can, which is a clay model. And this is sort of the idea that you're imagining what people would love. And for emotional things, that's a very appropriate process, okay? But for functional things, human-centered design 
is really going to make sure you, you, you meet all their needs. But you combine the two, human-centered design plus visionary, you know, uh, imaginative design, and then you start getting products that are really, really exciting. And then the last little process I'm going to leave you with, which anyone can use, it's so much fun, is to find things in nature that inspire you. This process is called biomimicry. And so in this case, you know, uh, I put together this mood board that is all about, you know, uh, art, you know, you can see an artichoke there, and there's these sort of repetition of patterns, okay? And then you use that as inspiration for designing your product. And by doing this, the, the aesthetics of the product will be very pure to your intent. So it's very powerful in keeping you pure to your design intent. That, that's, that, and that's hard to do, right? So if you took this and then you make a bunch of little concept models, this is actually some student work. You can see, you can see sketches um, down here, right? You can see, then they started cutting up paper and they, they took some tape and they taped it together. Here's another model over here. You know, it's made out of a, looks like a coffee cup, all right? But you see how quick these are? Very quick, very quick iterations. Also, they're not full scale, they're quarter scale. And, and then they used their cell phone to light it up. What an amazing way to explore solutions, right? So I encourage everyone to do this before they get into a CAD model that relate, results in this, right? And then, I'm sorry for the image quality there. But anyway, then you can actually laser cut those parts and assemble them, which will take you a long time to do, right? You don't want to be exploring the problem when it takes that long to make a prototype. But now you can see that the resulting outcome was very true to that original, uh, you know, kind of inspiration in nature. So uh, biomimicry, very powerful, um, and it usually uses nature as inspiration. So just to leave you with a couple of things uh, to, to hopefully, uh, you know, uh, percolate on, Desirability is key to successful outcomes. And we forget that because we're always worried as engineers, we're always worried about how do we make it work? How do we make that fit better? How do we make sure that material, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then the other thing I want to remind you of is that if you want a desirable product, you're going to have to use a designer. Pull in a designer, have them help you, you know? And they, they've been working their whole life to help you invent products, okay? So use designers. And then lastly, design it first, figure out what you want to do, and then think about how you're gonna make it, okay? So where do you wanna go? And then you pick how do you get there, not the other way around, okay? All right, so that is uh, what I'll leave you with. Thank you all, and um, you know, I just want to send my warmest wishes and support and love to everyone in Ukraine. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we are all uh, so behind you and, um, and care so much about you.